لأنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى والدين الحق فبلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وجهد في الله حق جهاده وترك أمته على محجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيد عنها إلا هالك والصلوات الله والسلام عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم الأحسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد Brothers and sisters Today I'd like you to keep a certain phrase in the back of your mind as we proceed through the khutbah And that phrase is that the matter of the heart is the heart of the matter Now Back about 900 years or so after the hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, in an area known as Bukhara, which is where the very famous Imam al-Bukhari is from, it's in Central Asia, about 900 or so years after the hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, there existed there a ruler, and this ruler's name was al -Abtagin. Now, al was known to be a very righteous, pious individual. And at a certain point, al had purchased a, you can say, a, a servant boy who was 12 years old. Now this, just to show you the character of al he raised this young boy as if he was his own son. So as he grew up, he taught him about, all, obviously about his deen, being close to Allah, having a heart that's close to Allah, and so on and so forth. And when he grew up, just to show you his character, al character, this young man, he married him to his own daughter, al own daughter, and made him the general of the army. This young man, his name was Subuk Tagin. And just having imbued all of that character growing up, when Subuk Tagin had a child, having the pious background that he had, when his child was born, when his son was born, Subuk Dugin makes a dua, he makes a supplication. And what he had in his mind at the time when he's making the supplication was Fathul Makkah. Remember the Prophet وسلم, when he entered Mecca after the end, or at the end of his, of his mission, he enters Mecca and one of the things that the Prophet وسلم, does is he destroyed all of the idols in and around the Kaaba. So keeping this in his mind, Subuk Tugin looks at this young child and says, Oh Allah, just like you have made the Prophet وسلم, a destroyer of idols and shirk, make my son a destroyer of idols and a destroyer of shirk. So this young man, he grows up, again, pious household. Now, the situation at the time, let's take a step back, the political situation at the time. Remember, we said that they were in an area of Central Asia. Actually, it's current day Afghanistan, in the area known as Ghazna. And this area bordered current day Pakistan, India, and so on and so forth. And what the situation was in that region, which we can say, let's say, Hindustan. In that region, there were a number of small Hindu cities, Hindu communities. And they didn't have any sort of a, a central hub in the sense that like a central leader. I mean, they had one maybe thousands and thousands of years ago uh, under the man by the name of Ashoka. But since then, there were just these little city states. They were divided up. And what they would do is they would launch excursions into the Muslim territory, into the Central Asian territory. And so they, they would, and during the reign of Alaptagin and Subotagin, their main idea or their main focus was just to keep the Muslim lands. In other words, when these excursions would come in from Hindustan, from the Hindus, their main focus was keep them at bay, keep the lands that we have. Now, when Subuk Dugin's son grows up, he grows up and those excursions are still happening. And he grows up and he takes over the leadership of that region. And one of the first excursions that comes in from Hindustan 
came in from an area which is current day Peshawar in Pakistan, for those of you who are familiar with the geography of that area. And there was a leader, a, 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 a pundit at that time, and he led his army to meet the Muslim army right at the border of, you can say, Afghanistan and Peshawar, where, where they meet. Now, when the son of Subuk Tugin got to that place, him and his army saw something they've never seen before. And what was that? Elephants. The Muslim army at that point had never faced an army that had along with it elephants. But yet, when the two armies met, the victory was decisively for the Muslims. And this man, the world knows him as Mahmoud al-Ghaznawi, rahimahullah ta'ala. Now, this was the very first excursion, the first battle, among 17 more to go. And what the books of history tell us was that when Mahmoud al-Ghaznawi, when he would go in to, he would go deep into the heartland of Hindustan, and he would have like a light infantry, go in quickly, take over a certain city, and then come right back to his center in Afghanistan. Very quick. But he had a certain practice. When he would go into a city, you see, when it comes to military strategy, there's military strategy and then there's understanding the psychology of the people that you're going up against. And he understood something about the people he's going up against. The Hindus, as you know, they have a caste system. You have the Brahmin caste, and the next, and the next, and you have the lowest caste, the Shudra caste. Shudra caste. When he would go into the city, because he understood what they believed, because they had a belief that as long as the idols of this city remain standing, no harm can come to us. So one of the things that he would do, and make it a point to do, is when he would go into the city, he would destroy the idols. Now what was the effect? This had a profound psychological impact, especially on the lower caste Hindus. Many of them became Muslim and joined the ranks of, of the Muslim army. So he would go city by city doing this, until he came to, you can say, the major hub of that region. Much like if you remember Mecca during pre-Islam, during the Ayyam Jahiliyyah. Remember, Mecca was a central hub. People would come from all over to pay homage and worship the idols of Mecca. So similarly, there was a central idol that the people of that region would come and travel to, to visit. Now, of course, for the leaders of that city, this had an immense amount of benefit. It had a financial benefit. That's the first and foremost thing. When people come, trade comes, money comes. So now, Mahmoud al-Ghaznawi has reached this city. And the Hindu leaders come outside the gates of the city. And they start to beg Mahmoud al-Ghaznawi, tell him, look, you can take whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. And they brought with them a tremendous amount of wealth. Gold, diamond, <laughs> jewelry, all sorts of wealth. And they're pouring at his feet. And they're saying, look, do whatever you like, but don't touch Somnath. That was the name of their main idol. Now, brothers and sisters, remember I said, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. At that moment, it was as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was testing the heart of Mahmoud al -Ghazim. Because he could have said something like, you know what, maybe I should leave the idol alone. Maybe it would be good for da'wah. Maybe I'll take a softer approach and so on and so forth. And he could have said many things to rationalize or justify leaving it alone. But when that wealth was poured at his feet, he said, if I accept this wealth, then the world will not know me as a destroyer of idols, it will know me as a supporter of idols. So get that wealth out of my way. So you can say, when his heart was tested with that wealth, he passed with flying colors. Now, just to finish off the narration, when they get inside the city and they go to the manda, the temple, and they go to see this idol. They come inside and they see something very odd. The idol seems to be floating. Now, when they looked around, they said the idol's floating. And upon closer examination, it was like an optical illusion. And the companions around, or the, the, the people, the army around Mahmoud al we said, look, if you break the walls, chip away at the walls, that idol will come crashing down. So sure enough, they start chipping away at the walls, and it comes crashing down. And when it came crashing down, when it burst open, it had within it diamonds, jewelry, 
gold, silver, much more wealth than the Hindu pundits were offering him. In fact, some of the books of history tell us that the very famous Kohenur diamond, the largest diamond in the world, they say, the one that's sitting in the British Museum today, they say even that was amongst the jewelry and the items that were inside of Stone Mount. Now, the point of that is not was obviously not to inform you about military excursions or anything like that. But the point was to understand that when this individual, when his heart was tested with wealth, he passed with flying colors. Brothers and sisters, um, I think people are waiting outside. If you could either come up a little bit, or I was told there's tarps and things outside where people can sit as well. But if you can accommodate with best your ability, please scoot up, inshallah. So, you may be familiar with another, how this kind of affects people. You see, there's a very famous speech by uh, the President John F. Kennedy, and it kind of focuses in on us living here today, even though the speech is obviously a bit dated. And he, he made a statement, he said, look, we live in a country that has 7% of the world's population, but 50% of the wealth of the world. So for us living here in this context, we are tested day in and day out. And in ways that we don't even think about. I'll give you a small example. You know, <laughs> when my brother, he had the opportunity to study in, uh, in Medina, at the University of Medina. And he was telling me that, you know, there were people that had come to the university and they had come from certain areas of Africa. And when they came to the dormitory where they were staying, he said they went into the bathroom and they turned on the faucet and just watched. Because this was the first time they had ever seen running water. Now I want you to think about that for a second. You and I, when it's time to make wudu, go to the bathroom, it's not even a second thought. Running water, we're done. And we get tested like this day in and day out. Whether, and some of us might say, look, man, I'm poor. I can barely afford my rent. But still, if you look across the world today, you still probably have it better than people across the world today. You know, there was another famous destroyer of idols. And you probably know of him. His name was Ibrahim, والسلام, the Prophet Ibrahim. And you remember what he had done when he destroyed the idols. I don't need to get into the story. But you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about a dua in Surah Al-Shu'ara that Ibrahim salam made. Now he's making this dua, asking for forgiveness for his father, and so on and so forth. He's making this dua, but in that dua, he gives us a picture, a description of the Day of Judgment. He says, oh Allah, do all this and this and this and this. On a day where neither wealth nor children will be of any benefit, and the only thing that will benefit is a heart that is sound. I want you to think about that for a second. Imagine you've now reached the Day of Judgment. You are looking across and the mountains have crumbled. The seas are on fire. And a child has been resurrected and this child's hair turns gray with everything that it sees. And everyone is running around in a state of panic. And the only currency on that day, my dear brothers and sisters, that will help you is a qalb that is saleem, a sound heart. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he chooses words, they're not just random. This term, qalb saleem, the term saleem, it's interesting. For those of you who study Arabic grammar or Arabic morphology rather, self. You know that this term, it falls on what's known as the fa'il form. And the fa'il form, salim, it signifies permanence, it signifies constancy. Right? So, for example, the word ta'wil is of the same form, right? Someone who's tall. Now, someone who's tall is not tall one day, short the next, tall the next. Constant, right? Now, a heart that is salim, it doesn't mean that it's always in the same state. But what it means is, it's constantly returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person is struggling and striving to get to Allah, 
And if they falter, they repent back to Allah. It is this constant struggle and striving. A heart that is sound. So the question then arises, how do you know if you have a sound heart? You know, there's a teacher of mine, and he said that he, had, he went to the hospital once to visit a man. And this man, he was about to pass away. And of course, one of the etiquettes is that when someone's about to pass away, you're supposed to encourage that person to take the shahada. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, whose ever last words are La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, this person will enter paradise. So we started to encourage this man. He started saying, Qul la ilaha illallah, Qul la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah. And the man, he said that the only thing that was coming out of his lips was the price to earnings ratio for Microsoft today is at such and such level. And I fear that my retirement account might have fallen by such and such. And the sheikh said that he passed away in that state. He couldn't say it. What was the state of his heart? Now, I don't want to leave you on, on a down note. So let me give you the opposite example. You know, there was uh, an incident that happened in one of the Muslim countries. And in this country, they said that it was a police officer. And this police officer, he says that when... I had got a call of an accident and I decided to get to the scene as quickly as I could, myself and my partner. He says, when we got to the scene of the accident, we saw that a, a, a man had stepped out from behind his car. He had taken out his spare and the, he was in a tunnel and a car came behind him because it was, the, the tunnel was too narrow and smashed him. So he, he got smashed between two cars. He says, when I got there, my partner, I saw this man, he was a young man. He looked religious. And his, his garments were crimson red, red with blood, and his bones were broken in so many places. So he says, we picked this man up and we put him in the car, trying to rush him to the hospital. He says, as we were picking him up, he said, I heard some sort of mumbling. He was mumbling something, and I couldn't make it out. So, he says, I remember that I'm supposed to encourage him to take the shahad, to say la ilaha Allah. He says, as I was about to tell him that, I recognized what he was mumbling. He said he was reciting the Quran. And it was the most beautiful recitation that I had ever heard. And he says that as I heard him, he continued to do this. And at a certain point, he raised his finger he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And his fingers slumped and he was no more. He says that I couldn't hold back my tears. I looked at my partner, he burst into tears, and I burst into tears. We couldn't imagine the, what, what had just happened. We couldn't believe it. He said, We got to the hospital, and everyone we told about it, they started to shed tears as well. They started to cry about this young man. But then we found out about this young man. What he used to do, his family told us that he used to have this old uh, Datsun, for those of you who are old enough to know that car, old car. And he used to drive it outside the city to a very poor village. And he would pack his trunk with rice and food, and especially he would put candies in his trunk because he didn't want to forget the little children. And he would drive to this village, and people would discourage him. Like, look, it's so far, you're going to take this journey and all of this. What are you doing, you know? He says, no. As I'm on my way there, I listen to the Quran. And with every mile that I travel, I hope for the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. A qalb that is serene, a heart that is sound. So the question, how do you know if you have a heart that is sound? Now, Ibn al-Qayyim, a very famous scholar, he actually gives eight signs. Now, I don't have the time to get into all those eight signs, but I wanted to give you just a few, maybe one or two. One of the signs that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions, he says that the person, now again, this is analyzing the heart, the person that has a sound heart, they consider themselves of the afterworld. They consider themselves as being in the akhirah already and they don't consider themselves in this dunya. They are in this dunya like a traveler, and they cannot wait 
to reach the hereafter. Ask yourself, my dear brothers and sisters, are you longing to meet Allah? The Prophet says, the one who loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. <coughs> and the one that hates to meet Allah, then Allah hates to meet him. Let me give you a quick litmus test to see if this is the state of your heart. Next time when you're making dua, look at what you're making dua for. Are the majority of things that you're making dua for related to this temporal world? Or are the majority of things related to al-akhirah, the reality, what's going to happen without a doubt? So that's the first sign that he mentions. The second thing that he mentions, he says that when this person misses his daily recitation of the Qur'an, he feels like he has lost all his wealth. And I started, when I read this, I said, SubhanAllah, Ya Imam al Qayyim, you're talking about daily recitation? We live in a day and age where our recitation is limited to the month of Ramadan. And he's talking about daily recitation. You know, this Qur'an, it's food for your soul. You know, when, you, when, when we look at the human body and we say, okay, well, we need nutrition, right? Where does that nutrition come from? If you trace it back, it comes from the earth. It comes from the soil, eventually, right? Not directly if it's vegetables and so on and so forth, but even the meat and all that you eat, it comes from the earth. Where does the human body come from? What's its source? The earth. It's made from clean, it's made from dirt and so on and so forth. So the body's nutrition comes from its source. Where does the soul's nutrition come from? Guess what? It comes from its source. Now what do I mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that يَسْعَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ they ask you concerning the ruh, the spirit, the soul. What is the answer? Say, قُلْ That it is from an amr rabbi It is from the order, the amr of Allah Azza wa So here's the question. How does Allah give orders or commands? Through His words. قُلْ فَيَكُونَ Right? And if the soul wants nutrition, where is it going to get those words? Allah, the Qur'an. So your connection with the Qur'an is nutrition for you. That's why Ramadan is so important. Because what Ramadan does, it says, yo, take a break from your body and focus on your spirit. Get the food of the ruh for a change. Because the rest of the year, you've been giving your body nutrition. Now it's time to take a break. My dear brothers and sisters, our disconnect from the Qur'an is one of the reasons that you see many of the issues that you see today. Our disconnect is why many of the youth today are having serious issues when it comes to their faith. I was on my way somewhere to deliver a khutbah recently, and the man, he was, there was a man with me, proud father. And he said to me, he said, you know, my son, he is half of the Qur'an. He's memorized the entire Qur'an. I said, that's wonderful, mashallah. He says, and he has a choice of a scholarship to Stanford and Harvard. And I was thinking, wow, what a proud father, right? I mean, maybe my ac by accident, one of my kids would be like that. Who knows, right? <laughs> but he was talking to me, happy, gleaming. And then his expression changed. He said, but he's become an atheist. He's become an atheist. Hafiz of the Qur'an? What's going on here? But this is not just an isolated... I can give you one. I've heard stories like this numerous times with people in communities around the entire U.S. So what are we going to do about it, my dear brothers and sisters? And I want to conclude with this. I'm in town today. I'm visiting you from Houston. And I'm part of an organization called the Islamic Education Research Academy. And we're presenting a course called the Eternal Challenge. And what this course covers, it covers two things. It covers what's known as the philosophy of science, the limitations of science, because a lot of doubts, shubahat, that are happening nowadays have to do with not understanding what is the value of science when it comes to what's known as epistemology. What is its value in terms of certainty? So one part covers that, but the more important part covers the Qur'an. How do you know that this Qur'an is from Allah? 
What are some of the gems in this Quran? And how do we answer neo-atheists and all of this sort of da'wah that's happening to our youth and perhaps some of us? How do we answer that? From the viewpoint of the Quran, this course is taking place, it will be starting tonight at, at right after, uh, at around 7 o'clock, right after Maghrib, I believe, going till 9.30 and then tomorrow all day. There's brochures outside. If you would like to connect with the Quran, to understand how to deal with these issues from the viewpoint of your maker, then I highly encourage you to come out to see what's being offered tonight. There's no registration required. You can just come tonight and just check it out. And inshallah, there are many doubts that inshallah will be cleared. Some of the questions that came, my, my philosophy professor says that there is no absolute truth. How would you answer that? My professor mentioned, these are college kids, my professor mentioned that the Quran is scientific mistakes. In geology, we talk about tectonic plates, but the Quran talks about a peg. Mistake. And so on and so forth. I can go on with all the questions. So when you get a chance, get the flyer and come out. Now in the end, my dear brothers and sisters, we started talking about a sound heart. And we asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put us on the path to have a heart that is sound. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our hearts firm upon his deen. Ya ala deen. O turn our hearts, keep our hearts firm upon the deen. Rabbana la tuzib qulubana ba'd id hadaytana wa habbana min ladun rahma inna la tuha. Ibad Allah, inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yusallun ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu sallu wa alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ta'ala ala Ibrahima wa ala ala Ibrahima inna tahamidu wajib. Aqimu salam.